Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Will, and if you're new here, I'm a leather artisan based in Cambridge. Today I've got something super special for you guys. I'm interviewing a woman who used to work for Hermes Paris. As you know, they're one of the best, if not the best, leather goods brand in the world. They are responsible for the Kelly, the Birkin, the Constance, and numerous other bags and luxury goods that are now known worldwide as the best there is. And I've got the absolute honour and pleasure of having a chat with her today. So I'd love you to join me and we will spend the next little while having a chat about where she is, where she's come from and what she's doing at the moment. So, should we get started? I'm not overly tall. Okay, now are you going to have a bigger space on the in your next place i am indeed hopefully once i can find my next space i haven't found one yet but i um uh i'm looking okay so um, how do we uh so do you want to introduce yourself for the starting of this okay so i am beatrice Emblard. i'm french I've been living in San Francisco for 34 years. I trained with Hermes in, for 14 years, or worked with Hermes for 14 years, and uh, started my own business, April in Paris, uh, in 1998. So I've been on my own working uh, on custom accessories. So. Um, I don't have a particular line. I just do custom work for clients. And how did you get into leather work? I went to visit the school where I trained in Paris and I fell in love with it. It was basically love at first sight. I walked in the workshop where they had an open house and um, just saw the work that the students had done and the workshop was this incredible old workshop with old wood and the smell of leather and glue and wax and you know years and years of uh of people being there it just um got me so i uh, applied took a test and started my program are you allowed to tell what tell us what that test was at this point or is that top secret but the what? I'm sorry. You said you took a test. Oh, it was an entry test to get into the school. Okay, fine. And what what's that school called? At the time, it was called Abbe Grégoire. So it was the Chamber and of Commerce and Industry of Paris. In Paris, um, it's a government school, and uh, they were doing a certificate of professional aptitude, which we call the CAP. Right. I don't think it exists anymore, but that's, uh, that's what we were doing. So we were training for two years full time to become leather workers. Two years full time, that's, that's pretty intense. It was pretty intense, yes. Did you um, maybe it? morning, five at night, four at night. Did I enjoy it? Yeah, the Would training you... part of it. I loved it. That's where I started blossoming. I uh, had a lot of problems at school. I had dyslexia, um, was never officially diagnosed then, but had a lot of difficulties following a regular program and had really bad grades all through, you know, um, ninth grade. You and me both. Really? Yep. So, you know, the, the French school system said to me, there's nothing we can do at the end of ninth grade. Um, go figure out your own way. You could either become a secretary or an accountant. Well, my grades in French were not great and my grades in math were even worse. So my options were pretty bleak. <laughs> yep, I had a similar chat with my, my teacher when I was leaving secondary school. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was not on a particularly academic path at that stage either. Yeah. You know, if you don't fit that very narrow path, um, there is very little they can do for you, at least 40 years ago, that was the case, or 50 years ago. But luckily, I found my path and my passion. 
and 40 years later, I'm still doing it, still loving it, and, um, you know, having a blast doing what I want to do. And have you always done fine leather stuff, or have you done other work as well for custom work, or have you ever done things that were not very intricate? So because of my training with Hermes, I was taught very particular methods. Um, I was kind of pushed to look at things and, um, and just always look at quality. So it's very difficult for me. It was kind of a brainwashed in a way into doing high quality product. And not that it was a bad thing. I think it was a wonderful training and a wonderful thing to have. And so it's very difficult for me to do things that are not high end and not um, luxury in a way. I have a hard time cutting corners. <laughs> you should teach me that skill. <laughs> yeah, so I cut corners only where I have to, which is uh, <laughs> on the actual piece. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's tricky and sometimes could be a little hindering in my process of creativity because I'm so structured and I always have my, you know, the voices of my masters in the back of my head and being able to come out of this sometimes is tricky, uh, but it gave me a very good foundation. So, yeah, I can imagine. What did you like most about your job at Emma's? Oh, I think it was the precision. I think it was, um, you know, learning about quality, uh, learning about um, all the different leathers and only working with luxury product. I think it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to go back once you've had that kind of training. I can imagine. Excuse me one second. Yep. I'm in a Zoom meeting. I'm going to need to have the voices down a little bit. I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you. And we get a taste of the Beatrice telling people off. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I've had for the past. How long have I been training with you now? Seven, six, seven months? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I haven't really calculated it, but around that. Neither have I. It's been fun though. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It has. It's, 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 it. Pardon? You enjoyed it a little bit? I have. I've mass I don't think I would be doing this with you now because um, the people watching that will be watching the recording of this. I've finished my level one now um, and I didn't have to do this meeting at all. Uh, Bee's become, I'd consider a friend at this stage. Um, so she's doing it out of the kindness of her heart, um, which considering she's French, I'm not sure there's a lot of heart there. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but we get along well. Um, so she's agreed to do this. Um, my next question for you is, what made you want to leave Emma's? I feel like I had reached my limit. Um, I always wanted to do more. I'm a, I'm a pretty ambitious person and I had goals and desires. And I think with Hermes, um, they are very structured and they do things in a very specific way, which I totally respect. You know, they respect, they, they have to protect their brand. But for me, I'd reach a point where there was not much more I could do. Oh. I wanted to create, I wanted to design. And, you know, ultimately the only way to do this was to have my own business. So it wasn't, it was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do is to leave Hermes. I went from a very secure job that I love to not knowing what my future was going to be. And um, it was a very scary, scary time. And can you tell me about that transition from going from MS to where you are now? So um, when I left MS, I also um, I went to work for somebody else just for a short time, just to kind of clear my mind. I needed to see what, what else was out there. And uh, it didn't last very long because obviously there wasn't much out there, <laughs> especially in San Francisco in the leather work. So it took me six months to just um, kind of put all my decks in a row and figure out what I wanted to do next. And ultimately, you know, I started my business um, from nothing. And when, you, start, when, when you started it, did you, um, were you only doing, making your own stuff or were you doing um, your leatherwork school as well when you first started? No, I was only doing April in Paris. So 
only my custom piece. I had to focus on one thing and try to do it well. Um, I started out my business wanting to do custom uh, with no business plan, no money. Uh, I'd left a job and <laughs> I just uh, believed that I could do it. Some would yeah. call it stupid. <laughs> what? <laughs> Some would call it stupid. I mean, no security and nothing. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Looking back, I called it stupid many times, but at the same time, I had no other choice. And I think when you don't have a choice, you make things work. You do, yeah. You know, nobody to hold my hand, nobody to um, pay my bills, nobody to support my daughter and myself. I made it happen. Did you, did you have your daughter at that stage, did you? I did, yes, she was little. I, I, your daughter is someone I, I've spoken to about six times because the times when I've either forgotten what time my lesson was or I was cancelling my lesson. Yeah. So I don't know a lot about that part of your life. Um, but you've so you've got two and you've got two branches to your business at the moment, don't you? You've got Amblard Leather Atelier and April in Paris. I do. And the, the former is your training school. Oh, you froze. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. And the, the former part, the Ambler Leather Atelier, is your training school, isn't it? It's my training school. And do you, um, obviously I know all about it because it's, I've been going through it, but do you, do you do it for beginners or is it only for advanced leather workers? Or tell me a bit about that. No, it's uh, mostly for beginners. Uh, once, in a, once in a while I have people like you that have a little bit of training and, um, you know, so, so I kind of go along, but mostly about 95% of my students are total beginners. So I have a very specific way of teaching people. Uh, it's very methodical. All the steps are pretty much laid out. Uh, and um, I feel like it works really well because for people that need to have an understanding on how things work, uh, it's always laid out very specifically. Yeah. So they're able to move fairly fast with absolutely no knowledge to begin with. Yeah, um, I, I didn't encounter that firsthand because obviously I had several years of experience before we met, but I did find it very methodical and very logically structured, which for someone that's just starting out, I'm just going to shut my window. There's a whole bunch of stuff happening outside. Um, uh, for someone who's just starting out, that can be quite a helpful structure to have. Yeah, I think so. I think you kind of have to have that structure to understand the process, especially when you get into bigger pieces. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, very easy to get lost. And um, there's so much to know and so much to learn. But having it being structured, at least for the first part of the program, then I introduce a little bit of creative skills, but for the first yeah. part, it's all about the skill itself. And what's the biggest change you've seen in the industry itself since you started all those years ago? Oh my God, huge change. Um, when I started in 98, there was hardly anybody doing what I was doing. Leather work was not a very popular situation. First of all, there was nobody really teaching it. The teaching was taking place mostly in Europe. Um, there were very few people interested in it, as I thought, you know, um, while there was no Instagram then, there was hardly any phone, so. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> gonna, phone. Was the internet around? Yeah. Just, just dating myself a little. <laughs> so the communication was very different. Now what I find is that there are classes or people, you know, wanting to learn and, mm -hmm. and wanting to learn the, the specific methods and the, the high-end, the more uh, luxury product. Yeah. And there's so many more people out there doing this. Uh, sometimes not always doing what I would consider the right thing, but I'm also very, very critical. So <laughs> yeah, you are. I don't know if I'm a perfect judge for that, except, you know, I have my standards that I need to keep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Critical is something... Although to be fair, when you're learning to do something for the first time, critical does, I find it helps because there's no point doing something, having a, having a teacher who's always very positive and doesn't, and doesn't 
feel comfortable telling you if something's not quite right because you're just going to go on in those bad habits and then going to become ingrained and you're going to have difficulty down the line undoing them. That's true. That's why I usually prefer students that have absolutely no knowledge. Unlike me. <laughs> and unlike you, so that I can really um, shape the process in a way that um, I feel, you know, when you don't have any understanding of what's good, what's bad, mm. not start with the good and then progress from there. Yeah. Um, so it's a much easier way for me is to take someone who has no knowledge, then I can do exactly what I want and train them the way I want specifically. Mold them how you see fit. Well, just, you know, I think I have a pretty good track record as quality. So if yep. we get to that level, then the world will be a better place. Yep. It's my um, philosophy. <laughs> where are we? Um, what do you like most about what, about working for yourself as opposed to working for MS? Well, I make my own decision. I decide what I want to do and what I don't want to do. I can turn a client down if I don't like the project or if I don't think they're going to be a right fit for me. Um, I can be as creative as I want. I yeah. can produce whatever I want. I don't have to fit a specific frame of mind of somebody else's way of looking at business. So I make my own decision. I create my own mistakes. I pay the price. I move on. I do something else. I learn from it, hopefully. Um, it's a much more creative process for me. <clears throat> do you still enjoy it as much as you did when you first started? I enjoy it more than I did when I first started. Because oh, now... I wasn't expecting that um, answer. <laughs> You weren't? I wasn't expecting that answer. Really? Well, as you are more able to create, um, you know, it's much more interesting mm. when you have to follow so many rules and somebody else's rule. As you know, because you had to follow mine for some things, mm -hmm. you know, the process is fun, but you're learning. So you have that um, insecure footing when you've been doing it for so long, uh, you kind of know what you're doing. So you have a little more flexibility and creativity. Oh, absolutely. And that, that's the, the fun process at this point for me. Working on incredible projects that no one, no one else has ever done, you know, getting approached to do things that um, have never been done before. That's where I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah, you told me very briefly about a couple of those i'm not sure if well i'm probably not allowed to say much about those but some of the very unusual projects you're talking at, you told me about are uh, do sound fascinating to try and get to work properly yeah no there are going to be challenges and that's the fun part i love that what learn even after 40 years you know Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not 40 years old yet, so um, I don't know, but um, we won't get into that. Um, what advice do you give to someone who wants to get into the industry if they are just beginning out? I would say don't quit your day job just yet. <laughs> um, it is not an easy path. It is... Um, you do have to create your own identity and that takes a little bit of time. I said, learn the trade and, and experiment and have fun. And, you know, again, when you really want something bad, you make it happen. There is no saying I can't do it because if you do, you're failing. But, you know, working at it, making mistakes, getting up and continuing, if this is really what you want to do, you'll make it happen. Follow your instinct. It's always what I've told people, and that's what I've done my whole life in this job. Followed my instinct. If something doesn't feel right, don't push it. Yep. You know, I mean, a lot of it is just a way of life. It's not just um, a business situation. It's, uh, I have no business sense, or I didn't, you know, when I started. I do a little bit more now, but I have a ninth grade education. I came to this country, I couldn't speak a word of English. Yet today I have two businesses that I run completely by myself and, you know, they're fairly successful. So, but I never said I can't do it. I plugged along, I did the work. <laughs> yes, you did do the work. I'll, I'll attest to that. You can't be lazy. Yep. 
Who, if anyone, inspires you? Um, that's going to sound cliche, but really the only company that inspired me all these years was Hermes. I mean, for me, they're the, they're the ultimate. And when I was 18, if I wasn't going to go work for them, I wasn't going to be in this field. My goal was to reach that level of quality. Mm -hmm. So inspired by what they've created in 180 something years or 90 years, I forget now, um, is definitely an amazing achievement and something I always look up to. Do I agree with everything they do now? No, but um, you know, they've, they've grown their business the way they wanted to, but I still respect the company as a whole. Uh, for the industry, there's really very few people that have achieved this, this level. Are there any individuals rather than companies who inspire you? Um, another company that to me is kind of up and coming is One Now. And, um, you know, I like the quality of their product. As far as individual, I can't pinpoint one person in particular. Um, I... I can't really say someone in particular. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not really on the social media much and I don't I really know. know what a bunch of people do. So uh, it's really hard for me to, <laughs> to really know so much what's going on out there. But um, there are a bunch of people that are doing really good quality work that I respect, but I don't want to name anybody in particular because I feel like it would be unjust to the other ones. Fair enough. What skill or skills do you find most important within the craft? The discipline. Uh, if you don't have the discipline to do this every day, um, no matter what you're going to try to do, I think it's going to be tricky. Really, this trade is about muscle memory. This trade is about building a skill that is not achieved overnight. It's not instant gratification. It's doing the work again, repeat, 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 repeat. And that's to me, the most important part of the process. You can use any material you want. You can use any technique, you can use any or not any technique, but you can use any tools you want. Uh, you can come up with tools that didn't exist and you can, but ultimately if you don't do the work, and put in the time, you're missing something. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can attest to that. One, I think the first thing, the, uh, the first thing I remember you saying to me after, I think it was maybe the first or the second project we, we completed in the, in the level one, you, um, you realized that I didn't know how to stitch with an all when I first started. And I tried to very, very much tried to convince you to let me continue not to stitch with it all but that wasn't going to happen <laughs> um not even a little bit so um after well i i managed it in quite a short period of time but that's besides the point that's you. <laughs> because that's you yeah because that's me i i'm i'm i work quite quickly as you know Mm -hmm. um but it's something that i did have to change very very quickly and i spent the next i think it was 45 minutes learning how to stitch with an awl that's not normal for most people but it was just muscle memory and it's doing right. something over and over and over again and what do you think now um i struggle to stitch without one now just because the way that uh, i can't remember what you you the way you described it but i can't stitch without using one now my hands just won't do it okay i'm I've, very happy to hear that i've got multiple tools now because i'm addicted to buying tools as you know um <laughs> which is for me it's a good thing i i know you're standing on having lots of tools you'd rather get good with one than multiple well, there's, there is a reason for that. Um, I could be getting a million tools, but my theory is when you're starting out your business and what I'm teaching is I'm teaching people that eventually want to start their own business. 
I don't want people to have to use several tools to do the same thing. No. Because I'm trying to be very mindful of someone who's starting out, who doesn't have unlimited funds and really want to do this. Yeah. So using one tool really well is going to pay the bills. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I so, just like tools. So it's a choice because I want to make sure that my student can succeed in their endeavor if that's what they want to do without having to break the bank. That's one of the major reasons why I don't get too many tools. And honestly, for me, it's easier. I mean, I pick up one tool, I put it down. I pick up one tool, I put it down. I don't have 50,000 tools to deal with and keep track of. It's already hard enough with all the, with all the ones we have. <laughs> I understand that so many tools are so much easier to do the trick. Again, my philosophy is you learn it well, you put in the time, you won't need to invest in 50,000 tools. You know, that's me, I'm a dinosaur. So what can I say? <laughs> you said it. <laughs> well, I'm very aware. And I think it's, uh, I mean, for me, it works well and it works well for my students. Um, the people I teach don't need to really invest in them if they choose to that's a different story but uh, when they're starting out i think it's important not to have to lay out a bunch of money to be able to do this i completely agree when i started i started with about four things i bought in a, a starter kit on Amazon, uh, ebay i think it was um and i mean they were all absolutely terrible but i learned from the ground up with about four things because I didn't have lots of money to put into tools. I still didn't have huge amounts of money, obviously. But at the time, I had enough money to buy a, a stitching chisel and a blade and a couple of other bits. And I learned with that because I was dedicated to learning the craft. What were the first tools that you purchased? So I purchased my first tools when I was 16. Actually, I remember going to a store in Paris. So I was fresh in that trade. And Blanchard had a store in Paris. And I remember, remember walking into that store with my parents. Mm -hmm. And um, it was uh, a feeling I never forget. Um, they were selling hides. The store was very old. They had old wooden cabinets built for tools and hardware, all those little drawers with brass knobs and all wood and wood floors and wood counters and everything was so old and it had been worn and it had that smell of leather. Um, I was like, okay, I'm in the right place. <laughs> that first, that's the first store I've ever been to where I purchased my first tools. And so the first tools were basically um, the sewing uh, things that I needed. So a, a stitching clamp and all, needles, a little bit of thread, a little bit of leather. Uh, I didn't get pricking irons because I don't think, I don't even know if they existed then. I'm not sure, but they were doing the wheels. So, and that's how I learned it's called too. So I had a pricking wheel uh, with all the different sizes. And um, that's pretty much what I started with. Yeah. Very basic for stitching. <laughs> That is very basic for stitching. And I still have those tools today. Oh, do you? I do. Do you still use any of them? Um, not really, because because <laughs> uh, I've gone other since, but you know, forty years ago. So, <laughs> but my my uh, my pricking wheel is still it's on my wall. It's here. I have see it every day. Damn. Is there anything you still find hard? Aside from um, the sort of, is there are any are there any skills you still find difficult? Um, I guess I'm at the point where I can actually um, do a lot of different things. I'm occasionally I still encounter things where I have to think, um, and I think it's mostly in designing new things. Um, things have evolved a little bit since I started. So, you know, you see some designs out there. I have some students that want to be able to duplicate certain aspects of the designs. 
and I usually don't let them design exactly the same as a designer. So they have to come up with their own designs. And, you know, sometimes I get into little challenges why I have to think. But I think I've done so many different things in my life that I'm able to figure things out fairly quickly now. So is there anything I find hard? Yeah, some things are still difficult, but I think what I find the hardest is managing my time <laughs> between the two businesses. And, um, and do you manage those equal 50-50 or do you put more time and effort into one of them? Why now I put more time in the school. Um, I teach three days a week and I only work on April in Paris two days a week. Uh, but I have two people working with, it, with me on April in Paris now. So I also have to deal with all the business side of it. So it's, um, it's a little tricky. Because it's your daughter who works with you and Misty that works with you, or is there someone else as well? I have someone else right now uh, who's a contractor, actually a former student who does an incredible job. She started her own business and I represent her bags in my store right now. Oh, wow. Um, her name is Fabiana and she does, she put in the time. She did what I suggested she do. It's um, make the same thing many times to really get the, the skill down. And her level of craftsmanship today is incredible to the point where one, I, I represent her in my store and two, I asked her to work for me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I have, there's three of us on April in Paris right now. And yeah. two of us on the school, not including Misty, who kind of runs both of them on the logistic end of it. Yeah. And what should someone who's not beginner, but someone who's intermediate advanced be doing to improve their career prospects? Aside um, from doing the same thing a million times. <laughs> So it's to, to find their own voice, is to, to create designs that should be fairly unique. Um, because again, now there's, there are more people on the market. So you really have to find a way to differentiate yourself from anybody else if you want to succeed. Mm -hmm. And have a good marketing team. Because ultimately, you need to put yourself out there. You know, I build my reputation on word of mouth, the old fashioned way. Uh, when there was no Instagram, TikTok, chat, whatever that's called. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning. Um, I'm putting that in the title of this video, the TikTok chat. Yeah, um, it's a new one, just came out. Yeah. So you, you kind of, you know, starting small, little bit at a time, one client at a time, word of mouth, you do good work, people will spread the word. And uh, today, uh, that's still true. I still believe that that's probably the best mode of reference, but um, you need to put yourself out there if you want to succeed. Yeah. And it depends on your ambitions too and what you want to do with it. If you want to keep your business small, it's not going to take much to make you live. Yep. The... Um... I, I was in an unusual boat, obviously, because I, I was already selling things and stuff when I started working with you. Um, yeah. So I didn't, so it was a bit different for myself, but I do get that for someone who's just beginning is, is getting your name out there being the most important thing. I am um, about, what is it? 80% of the people that watch my videos are in the States. So yeah, it was, I didn't know it until I looked the other day, but about 80% of the people that watch these videos are in the US. So do you want to tell me a little bit about the sort of lessons that you guys, that you guys do and how, how people obviously put the information in the description box below this video, but mm -hmm. what, what they can learn with you? So um, we have a very wide range of uh, possibilities as far as classes. Uh, since COVID, we really expanded our horizon. And as the program, the typical program is still one year long to learn all four levels, um, we've, we've gone a lot more flexible as far as other things. You can go from a, an evening class, two hours, to doing a half a day, to do a whole day. We do intensive classes 
every other month, whether it's one week or three weeks, where you can come for four days and basically in the three-week program, complete one level in three weeks, um, which is the equivalent of 12 classes. So every level that we have is 12 days. Now uh, we go with people's own pace and it's pretty much one-on-one -on -one as we're keeping the classes pretty small. We go between two and seven people at the most. I really wanna make sure that I give 100% to the people that sign up. Now, um, we also do Zoom classes, um, so virtual. We're getting pretty booked up, so um, there might be a wait list. And what I teach is really starting out with the basics. And between learning how to use your, your blade properly without, so you don't, you can cut for a long period of time and not hurt yourself. And I know, Will, that seems redundant and you <laughs> pass that test really quickly. Or um, it is to learn the traditional methods of saddle stitching, um, hedge finishing. So in level one, 12 days, you complete six projects. Each one is created to help you progress. Um, what seems to be slowly, but at the same time, every project has a different set of situation that will teach you something new. I don't let the creative process come into play right away. This is something that takes place in level two. Uh, once I feel like all the basics are down and you know how to cut, stitch, finish, glue, then we can move on to a little bit more creative. So I incorporate the design, you know, slowly but surely. It's very progressive. So by the time you get to handbags, which you start at level two, uh, you don't feel like it's such a big leap, you know, as if you, if I started someone with a handbag and they never touched a piece of leather before, <laughs> they they have a uh, there's no way I can do this. By the time they get a handbag and they've done 12 classes, well, it doesn't seem so crazy. So I feel I know the program has been tested by over 400 people. Um, I feel like you know, it speaks for itself. If you go on our Instagram or our Facebook, you can see all the different projects that come out of here. And I'm really proud of what uh, we're doing here. Yeah, no, the, it, some of the designs I'd never seen before. Uh, like this no, is, unique. yep. It's, uh, <laughs> how long, for the average student, how long does something like this take to do? Well, considering that it's project three, uh, someone who's never stitched, cut and finished, <clears throat> it would probably take them between five, six, seven hours. So they, they could complete this project in one day. And that's one of, how many is it that I did? Seven, something like that? I can't remember. Six projects in level one. Yeah, six projects. And um, for, for level one, you guys uh, supply all the leather. Do you, do you supply all the leather for the first one? Is it the same for the second level as well or? Yes, actually we supply the leather for all four levels. Okay. So people that want to take a class, walk in, we have everything for them. Tools, leather, um, and we have everything. They don't need to buy anything. Now we, give you the opportunity when you get to a certain point to purchase all the equipment so you can start doing some work on your own. I don't suggest doing that until people have actually gone to the point where they can stitch on their own well. Well, you say that I needed one of these. Yes, so uh, those are actually created specifically for us. They're all custom, one of a kind, basically. Um, so bloody sharp. Bloody sharp, really good steel. And beautiful, aesthetic. Yeah. No, it is beautiful. It's um, the only, uh, was it, I can't remember if it was the first, uh, uh, the, it was, it was after the first project. Was it after the first? I can't remember, but I I had to, you guys sent it over to me um, with one of the orders I put in because I didn't have an all and you wouldn't let me go on without one, so. <laughs> No, all no class. <laughs> yep. It's fine if you're coming into class because you've got all these million tools there for people to learn and use when they come into class. Right. 
Yep. Do you it is definitely the advantage of coming in versus doing virtual. Um, yeah. So we're only doing level one at this point. And in that case, when we do virtual classes, we provide everything. People have to actually purchase all of their equipment then, yeah. uh, the tools to be able to do this. So it's a different set of motivation. Yeah, for sure. Do you, is there anything about working at MS that you miss? Not really. <laughs> it's been so long. It was like uh, several lifetime ago for me. Um, I think I'm in a position where I'm very happy with what I'm doing. And, you know, whatever I'm missing, I'll provide. So, no, I think maybe the camaraderie that we had with some of the people that I worked with and being in a workshop and not working alone, which I did for several years after I started April in Paris. I worked alone and... It wasn't the most fun part of that situation, but now I'm surrounded by people every single day. So I think I filled that gap pretty well. Okay. Is it right that you, how, how did you transition between working in France and working in San Francisco? So, um, like how did that work? Did, because they offered you a job in San Francisco, didn't they? Yeah, so what happened is I, after working in Paris for four years, um, I came to the US, I realized I was missing not being able to speak English, so I wanted to go back to learn English. <clears throat> so I asked MS if they would let me go for six months and then take me back, and they accepted. So I came back to the US, learned English a little bit more, and, um, and then MS was opening a store in San Francisco, needed a craftsperson in the store, and since they knew I wanted to be here, then they offered me the job. Is that store still there? Uh, well, it's, a, it's, it's still in San Francisco. It's at a different location than it was when I first moved here, but it's still in San Francisco. Yes, they still have it. And they have a craftsman there as well. They replaced me with somebody else. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they did. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm happy. I mean, that's great to have somebody in the store like that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, was it doing repair work and things in the store or what sort of thing were you doing there? Yeah, I was doing repairs. Um, I was doing a lot of belts and watch bands too, because there was definitely a need, but it was mostly repairs. And after 10 years, you know, it was time to do something else. <laughs> how, many, how many belts? I do, as they say. Yes. Yeah. It was an amazing opportunity for me. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Um, did you what was I going to say I had something in my brain there did you work on the obviously very famous bags like the Kelly and the uh, Birkin and uh, Constance and these these things so the Birkin wasn't really a popular bag at the time but yes the Kelly Constance Lady all the classic Hermes, uh, all the rigid structure and all the calves and exotic skins. And while well, I transferred after a while to the exotic skin department. So I got to work on all the alligators, ostrich, lizard, elephant skin, and several different things that I didn't even know existed. Yeah, when um, you told me that there was elephant leather, I was kind of shocked by that, actually. Yeah, nobody uses it anymore, really. But um, you know, in the 80s, we did. <laughs> what What was your, are there any points where you messed up a very expensive product? Yes, actually, speaking about elephant. Uh, <laughs> I already know the story. I just want them to hear it. You know, I worked, uh, they gave me a, an elephant bag to work on. And uh, one other technique that I see a lot of people do today, which makes me cringe because... Um, Obviously, I have had an experience that made me change my ways. Uh, I was melting some wax on the edge uh, with a hot iron, and the wax melted onto the skin, and the front of the bag was shot. Now, we're talking several thousands of dollars. Needless to say, they weren't particularly happy with me that, that day. <laughs> what happens? Do they throw the whole bag away? Do you unpick the front panel? What, what happens when that happens? And the bag was finished. I had to rip the front panel. We had to start all over again. So um, it was a very uh, hard lesson to learn. 
but um, one of my teaching is definitely not melting wax on your edge. <laughs> so I used to actually, I think that that came up in conversation between us when I, because uh, I was trying to do that during one of our edge finishing classes. A lot of people do. And yeah, I don't know why, I don't know where I got the idea from, honestly, but and then you told me about that and I don't think I've done it since. Oh, okay. I, I, so I do listen to you sometimes. Oh, well, good. Good to know. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Once in a while you'll have my voice in the back of your head. Yeah, I still do. I still, well, still, it's not been that long, but I, I do get your voice in the back of my head saying, no, do not put that wax on that, on that edge, otherwise you'll the otherwise you'll screw up the uh well i'm not working with thousands of dollars of elephant skin but right i i looked it up after that it's quite a um controversial leather to say the least oh it's totally controversial and i would never be using that today would you not i really never even thought about what i was using you know, it's funny. It was not even part of my consciousness. Today, there's no way. Like, I don't use crocodile. Uh, I rather use alligators because I know they're not endangered. And they're usually farmed, not um, any other way. So I'm pretty, I try to be pretty conscious of the type of leather I use. I, I'm not at that point yet of thinking, what am I using? Because i it comes in a roll to my house and you wouldn't like I don't even think about it at the, at the moment which I think is pretty bad actually because I'm cutting into what used to be a an alive animal um and I'm making a wallet out of it or whatever um but I don't think too much about where it's come from I should I definitely should but well in the very near future actually it already exists we're going to have some alternatives and I'm actually very excited because I work with one other company that produces alternative to leather and not to replace leather completely. <clears throat> but for people that are very conscious about what they're getting or wearing, uh, we're gonna have that opportunity now. So that's gonna be very exciting very soon. Can you tell me anything more about that? Not really. <laughs> they had me sign an NDA for a reason. Oh, did they really? Oh, yeah. And I, I asked them and said, please have me sign an NDA when I get sued. <laughs> but a wonderful company to work with. I'm very close to them and um, exciting news. That's good. I watched a video yesterday, I think it was, about a, a leather alternative made from uh, mango pulp. Oh, yeah. Um, and um, like it comes in millimeter thick sheets like two foot square sheets i just can't see how that's going to be strong at all well they have to use sub subsurfaces like cotton or linen or something to support it it can be sustained on its own yeah well the, according to this they were just using some chemical as a strengthener but they weren't putting any sort of substrate in it but uh I get that there's a very big sort of uh, vegan and vegetarian market out there. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I, my, I'm not closed minded about it. I know that, that it, it, there's definitely the market there. But at the same time, leather is very, very, very strong and has been used since the dawn of time. Yeah. It's going to be a while before we have something. <clears throat> that is um, of the same caliber of leather. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's some, definitely some companies that are really going towards something similar, not to replace it again, but similar. And, and they're making a lot of progress. Technology is pretty incredible. And, and um, you know, they'll still take a few years to get to the point where we can use this material for a long period of time, like we can leather, but it'll happen. I hope so. On that note, I think we've run out of time. Okay. So, um, and I have got, have I? 
Yep, I've got through. I've got uh, the reason I keep looking down is because I've got all of my questions here. Okay, and they all answered. I got through all fourteen of them, so I'm happy about that. Um, Very. So this video will go live probably in a week's time. Uh, I'm thinking it's probably going to go live on the um, on the thirtieth. So we'll go, go out then because I've got an hour's worth of footage to edit through. Um, okay. Is there send any me a link? Pardon? You'll send me a link? Yep, I will send you a link. Um, I will email you a link over to the video. Is there anything okay. you want me to edit out that you want don't want in the video? No, because I don't usually say things that I don't want to be said. So you're okay um i'll put the links to all of your to your website and to your social medias in the um description as well uh, yep. so people can find that um and you might get a few more few more students out of it sounds good and <laughs> yeah can i get a few more views if we put it out on our social media i think it probably will yeah we've got over a thousand oh, 1600 followers between both um, businesses, so. In which case, yeah, more than I do. Buy any of them, just so you know. They're all <laughs> organic. <laughs> well, I guess, well, um, it, it'll either go out next Wednesday or next Friday, but going through an hour of footage is gonna be a, um, it's gonna be, take a few hours to do. Um, yeah. But uh, thanks very much for that. And I will email Thank you, you. The, uh, the link as soon as it's up. Sounds good. Um, good well, and I'll talk to you soon. Yep, baby. Bye. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed that look into the life of a master craftswoman. She's been a pleasure to have a chat to today, and um, I hope you guys got a lot of useful tips and tricks out of it. If you live in the US and you are looking to get some lessons, please do reach out to B. She is a brilliant teacher. And I look forward to seeing you next time.